In the heart of sub-Saharan Africa, where commerce meets progress, welcome to Soup News, your source for business, economy, and development insight to drive nations forward. From the vibrant streets of Lagos, Africa's fastest economic hub, Soup News takes you on a journey of discovery, analyzing and reporting the facts that lay the foundation for growth and development. We don't just report the news, we create it. Soup News is more than a channel. It is a catalyst for change, spotlighting the stories that shape economies, inspire entrepreneurs, and fear progress. Covering business, finance, technology, energy, and many more, Soup News provides a daily deep dive into the stories that matter, interviews with industry titans, and analysis that empowers your understanding of economic landscape. Join us daily as we dissect, discuss, and deliver the most relevant and factual news on business and the economy. Soup News is your trusted guide, empowering you with the knowledge to make informed decisions. Idumota Market Eko Idumota, once a residential neighborhood, is home to Idumota Market located on Lagos Island. It is one of the oldest and arguably one of the largest markets in West Africa. Idumota is a historic neighborhood adjacent to the Lagos port that facilitated the slave trade and later under the British indirect rule, it surrounded to exports that fueled the colonial enterprise. Idumota was also the location of an armed forces remembrance cenotaph called Soja Idumota, built as a monument to Nigerian soldiers who served with the West African Frontier Force, an Ayo Masquerade statue and a clock tower are also some monuments at Idumota. Idumota market is so popular that large sales are recorded as early as 7 a.m. The market is made up of hundreds of lock-up shops occupying several multi-story buildings with some measuring about five or more floors. In 2010, the Lagos state government demolished some illegal structures in order to improve vehicular and human movement in and around the market. During weekdays, the neighborhood of Idumota is densely populated by shoppers, traders and bus passengers. From the Carter Bridge, ascending into Lagos Island, passengers can see the neighborhood before disembarking at their final destination. Idumota market accommodates the substantial inflow of imported goods. The bulk of imports from abroad are routed first through Idumota and then on to other markets through Nigeria and other West and Central African countries. The energy of private Idumota traders and wholesalers facilitate this activity, where millions of US dollars worth of wholesale is exchanged daily. Idumota Markets Souk Enlightenment My name is Yenka Babalola my name is Ijama Pelo Koro. My name is Joshua Hassan. I am Rotarian or Most Sunday Lawson. It's Ife Yungwarita AJZ. My friends call me Ife. My name is Rotarian Lola Dari. I'm inviting you to keep watching Souk News. It's the right station to tune to. I like Souk News. Souk News is good. I want to charge you all to listen to Souk News. Watch the news. You can have unlimited news first time. Find Souk News. Be with Souk News. Never switch off. You are better for it. Sick news is the real thing. Listen to their coverage and you'll be glad you did. Turn to your YouTube, turn to your Instagram, turn to all your digital, digital channels and look for Sook News. Keep watching. Keep watching. Please, guys, keep watching. Sook News. Broad Street. Broad Street, situated in Lagos Island, is steeped in Nigerian history. Once the biggest financial hub of the country, it housed the headquarters of major banks linked to CBN, the stock exchange, and the loads of lender companies. Broad Street is a historically significant street. It has played a central role in the development of Lagos and history, an important commercial and administrative center for the British colonial authorities. It was also a home to some of the city's earliest modern buildings. Broad Street was a residential area in the pre-colonial era. With the British came the Methodist Boys High School in 1878 and the Broad Street Prison in 1882, renamed Freedom Park. 
The General Hospital, which was a British military hospital, was built in 1893, being the first general hospital in Nigeria. The old British Secretariat building, which is now the Federal Ministry of Justice, was built in 1906. Broad Street has seen a full turn into modern commercial office blocks, complexes, skyscrapers and markets from the outer marina through a combo early into the Adeliji Adele Road. Broad Street is one of the busiest streets in Nigeria on weekdays, where commercial activities take place day and night. From modern buildings to ancient structures, this street gives one a raw dose of life in Lagos. Broad Street is often referred to as Lagos Financial District. It boasts a mix of architectural styles, reflecting its long history, colonial era buildings, Victorian and Edwardian architectural features, alongside more modern skyscrapers and structures. Broad Street remains a vital, vibrant part of Nigerian economy. Broad Street. Souk Enlightenment. My name is Dr. Ajili Tobihis. My name is Etemarie Glover. Naomi, well done and shout out to Souk News. Shout out to Souk News. Um, I want to encourage everyone to keep watching Souk News. Shout out to Souk News and yes, tune in to them. Keep watching Souk News. They are one in town. Hey, we're watching Sook News. Keep watching Sook News. Keep watching Sook News. Catch them on YouTube and all social media channels. Hey, my name is Frank Edowo and I'm imploring you. No, forget that. I am forcing you, coercing you to always stay tuned to Sook News for your news requirements. Latif Jackonde. Born Latif Kayode Jackonde in the Ekbetedu area of Lagos Island, Lagos State, on July 1929. He studied at the Lagos Public School at Enwawa, Lagos Island, then at Bonham Memorial Methodist School, Port Harcourt, King's College, enrolled at Elisha Grammar School, where he edited a literary paper called The Quarterly Mirror. Jack Onde began a career in journalism in 1949 with the Daily Service and joined the Nigerian Tribune in 1953. The owner, Chief Obafemi Awolowo, appointed Jack Onde editor-in-chief of the Tribune in 1956. Jack Onde established John West Publications in 1975 after leaving Tribune and began to publish the Lagos News. He served as the first president of the Newspaper Proprietors Association of Nigeria, NPAN. Jakonde ran for election as executive governor of Lagos State in 1979 on the Unity Party of Nigeria platform. His administration was effective and open and implemented the cardinal policies of his party. He introduced housing and educational programs targeting the poor building new neighborhood primary and secondary schools and providing free primary and secondary education. He gave poor people's children education and many of them are now very prominent in the society today. Jack Onde established the Lagos State University and constructed over 30,000 housing units. After the military takeover in 1983, Jack Onde was charged prosecuted and convicted of treason and later pardoned. He served as Minister of Works under the Sani Abacha military regime. He died in Lagos on February 11, 2021. Latif Jakonde was the first civilian governor of Lagos State. Latif Kayode Jakonde, Souk Enlightenment. The challenge of governance is to see how we can leverage what is on the ground and convert this to world for the people. Russia, China are gaining entry into Africa and it would appear that some Western countries are losing out. You're working as an expatriate worker, then you're paid in your currency. But then if you must spend those money, you need to convert those money to the local currency to spend. For social security to work, we need to know exactly how many we are. We don't have a precise number. We need to know exact location of people. When we address this exchange rate volatility, 
we will see definitely the cost of goods and services will come down. From a security point of view, we should employ the technology to ensure that we can track individuals and goods uh, within the continent. This is early exchange with Femi Ayodele. You know, the early exchange is all about shaping policy and advanced development with our conversation today. We're set to give you the best of programming. And blessing Aiche. But they hope that you enjoy every time you spend it us here today. The world needs peace. The world needs to come to a round table and find solutions to the pockets of troubles. Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development. Yes, good morning and welcome to Early Exchange where we talk about issues related to business, finance, policy and the economy. I am Femi Ayodele. What a way to start the week. It's a new day and a new week. Interestingly, what a unique week is the week in the Christian calendar being called the Passion Week, the beginning of the Passion Week. And for us at uh, Souk and Early Exchange, we are set to give you the best of programming you know, as Easter is approaching. I hope you're good and glad you have you joining us on Early Exchange this morning. As we always do, to shape policy and advance development with our conversation, today we'll be looking at the strength of the Naira and efforts being made by the CBN to strengthen the Naira. Will you say the effort is paying off with the results we've gotten in recent times? That's going to be the trust of our conversation today. Don't forget, it's your program. You can be part of the conversation by joining us on our social media platform on our YouTube page using the hashtag LE Exchange. As you know, we are doing on this program. Blessing is here, set to give you the best of program. Oh, really? What's the twinning? Yeah. <laughs> good morning, Femi. How good are you morning. doing? Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good. You How look was sharp weekend? and... Yes, you know, Monday's energy is different from every other day. Oh, great. Oh, great. You know, there's one good thing about the weekend. It gives you room to re-strategize yes. for the week. And it's the beginning of a special week, the Passion Week. Oh, yes. What a strategic day. Yes. And so I think that passion uh, that uh, Christian Faithful are having towards uh, remembering and just uh, thinking about what uh, Christ has done, uh, we can also channel it to uh, our individual lives, whatever we do, business, career, and make it one that when we look back on this day, we can say, yes, it was worth doing, and we actually did that, which was necessary to produce great changes and great results. Let's begin the show this morning by taking you to our new studio, where Lavina Emma is standing by to update you on current happenings. Stay tuned. Good morning, Femi and Blessing, and hello. Welcome to the news update on Souk News. I am Lavina Emma. Nigeria's Senate President, Godswill Akwabio, has emphasized the critical role of parliamentary diplomacy in global peacekeeping efforts. Akwabio, speaking at the 148th Assembly of Inter-Parliamentary Union and Related Meetings in Geneva, Switzerland, underscored Nigeria's commitment to leveraging parliamentary mechanisms for conflict resolution and peace building. While commending legislative milestones such as the Not Too Young to Run Bill and Nigeria's active participation in international peacekeeping missions, he stressed the importance of collective action in addressing global challenges and highlighted the Nigerian Parliament's efforts in curbing polarization and promoting unity through legislation and international engagement. Akwabio also outlined initiatives aimed at enhancing accountability, promoting gender equality, and combating insecurity, including the establishment of the National Center for the Control of Small Arms and Light Weapons. Moving on, as part of efforts to bolster the nation's economy and promote local production, Nigeria's Minister of State for Health, Dr. Tunji Alausa, has advocated the discontinuation of medical syringe imports into the country. This call gained traction during a recent visit by Professor Mojisola Adeyeye, the Director General of National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, NAFDAC, to the Afri-Medical Manufacturing and Supplies Limited. 
Limited syringe factory in Ogun State, where the challenge of substandard medical device imports was addressed and indigenous manufacturing championed. NAFDAQ boss Professor Adeyeye echoed this sentiment, expressing the agency's determination to cease issuing import authorizations for syringes, redirecting focus to local manufacturers, and collaborating to enhance production standards. Despite potential initial cost implications, Professor Adeyeye stressed that increased production volumes will ultimately drive down prices. And away from Nigeria, early tallies for Senegal's presidential election indicate that opposition candidate Basiru Diomaye Faye is leading, prompting his supporters to take to the streets in celebration in Dakar. At least five of the 19 candidates have already congratulated Faye as the results continue to emerge, though the ruling coalition's candidates, former Prime Minister Amadou Ba, suggests that a runoff may still be necessary. This election follows three years of political turbulence and anti-government protests, with millions of voters participating in a peaceful election day. The outcome of the election carries significant implications for Senegal's political landscape, potentially marking the end of President Marquis Sall's administration, which faced criticism for its handling of economic challenges despite promoting investor-friendly policies. With turnouts at 71%, the initial tallies show fire leading in the capital, triggering jubilation among his supporters. In another development, Southern African lead, regional leaders have reiterated their commitment to their peacekeeping mission in the restive eastern Congo, condemning a recent protest from a letter from Rwanda opposing United Nations support for the mission. Deployed on December 15, the Southern African Development Community's mission to the Democratic Republic of Congo aims to assist the Congolese government in restoring peace and security in the conflict ridden region. During a summit in Zambia's capital, Lusaka, leaders reaffirmed their mutual defense pact, declaring that an armed attack against one member state constitutes a threat to regional peace and security. Expressing disapproval of Rwanda's letter to the United Nations Security Council in February, regional leaders emphasized solidarity in their efforts, even as forces from the from East Africa and the United Nations peacekeeping mission began their withdrawals in November and December, respectively. Finally, in a bid to enhance industrial chains and attract more foreign investment, Chinese Vice Commerce Minister Guo Tingting has stressed the country's commitment to granting national treatment to foreign companies, ensuring equal opportunities for investment and cooperation with domestic firms. This was revealed during a China Development Forum in Beijing. Those specifics on guaranteeing national treatment were not provided. This pledge aims to address long-standing complaints from Western firms regarding unequal access in China's vast consumer market and global supply chain. In light of concerns about economic coercion and geopolitical tensions, including with the United States, China seeks to reassure foreign investors by emphasizing its dedication to protecting their rights, enlarging market access, and fostering a first-class business environment. And that's all for now on News Updates. I am Lavina Emma. Many thanks for watching. Do stay tuned to Early Exchange with Femi and Blessing. The challenge of governance is to see how we can leverage what is on the ground and convert this to world for the people. Russia, China are gaining entry into Africa and it would appear that some Western countries are losing out. You're working as an expatriate worker, then you're paid in your currency. But then if you must spend those money, you need to convert those money to the local currency to spend. For social security to work, we need to know exactly how many we are. We don't have a precise number. We need to know exact location of people. When we address this exchange rate volatility, we will see definitely cost of goods and services will come down. From a security point of view, we should employ the technology to ensure that we can track individuals and goods uh, within the continent. These this early exchange with Femi are your daily. You know, the early exchange is all about shipping policy and advanced development with our conversation today. We're set to give you the best of programming. And Blessing Aiche.
We do hope that you enjoy every time we spend with us here today. The world needs peace. The world needs to come to a round table and find solutions to the pockets of troubles. Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development. All right. Thank you, Lobina, for giving us the news update, taking us around the world. We'll go on a short break now. When we return, we'll kick off our conversation as you guys efforts being made by the CBN to strengthen the Naira. Stay with us. My name is Yinka Babalola. My name is Ijama Pelo Koro. My name is Joshua Hassan. I am Rotarian or Moss Sunday Lawson. It's Ife Yonwarita AJZ. My friends call me Ife. My name is Rosary Lola Dari. I'm inviting you to keep watching Sook News. It's the right station to tune to. I like Sook News. Sook News is good. I want to charge you all to listen to Sook News. Watch the news. You can have unlimited news first time. Find Sook News. Be with Sook News. Never switch off. You are better for it. Sook News is the real thing. Listen to their coverage and you'll be glad you did. Turn to your YouTube. Turn to your Instagram. Turn to all your digital, digital channels and look for Sook News. Keep watching. Keep watching. Please, guys, keep watching. Sook News. The National Theatre, Igomu. Built during the military regime of Olusegun Obasanjo and finished in the time for the Second World Festival of Black Arts and Culture. Festac in 1977. The theater holds amazing treasures and memories. The artworks fill everyone with pride. The National Arts Theater is visible from the motorway which connects Lagos Island and the mainland. The National Theater is packed with the artworks of a legendary contemporary Nigerian artist, stained glass wars by Yusuf Grillo, sculptures and murals by Lamidi Fakeye, Erabo Emopai, and many others. It was put to full use for a month as one of the four venues of the Second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture, tagged Festac 77. The complex hosted 16,000 participants from 56 African countries and the diaspora in an unprecedented showcase of African music fine art, literature, drama, dance, and religion. The National Art Theatre was built and designed by Techno Experts Troll, a Bulgarian company mirroring the Palace of Culture and Sports in Varna, Bulgaria. Completed in 1976, the building is one of the largest and most beautiful of its kind on the African continent. It consists of a central hall with 5,000 seats, a collapsible stage that can be quickly rebuilt, a conference hall with 1,600 seats, two large exhibition halls, and two cinemas with 800 seats each. The theater complex has a dressing room for artists, a garage, offices, coffee bars, and a buffet. It has indoor TV and radio systems, as well as booths with facilities for simultaneous translation of languages and hectares of lush green lawn around. The majestic structure sits in Igomu like a quiet mountain, mesmerizing visitors and passers by. The National Theatre. Souk Enlightenment. The challenge of governance is to see how we can leverage what is on the ground and convert this to wealth for the people. Russia, China are gaining entry into Africa and it would appear that some Western countries are losing out. You're working as an expatriate worker, then you're paid in your currency. But then if you must spend those money, you need to convert those money to the local currency to spend. For social security to work, we need to know exactly how many we are. We don't have a precise number. We need to know exact location of people. When we address this exchange rate volatility, we will see definitely the cost of goods and services will come down. From a security point of view, we should employ the technology to ensure that we can track individuals and goods uh, within the continent. These, this early exchange with 
FMI are your daily. You know, Daily Exchange is all about shaping policy and advanced development with our conversation today. We're set to give you the best of programming. And blessing Aiche. But they hope that you enjoy every time we spend it us here today. The world needs peace. The world needs to come to a round table and find solutions to the pockets of troubles. Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development. All right, let's begin our business of shaping policy and advancing development for today by looking at efforts being made by the CBN to strengthen the Naira. For many Nigerians, the exchange rate between the dollar and the Naira has been of concern, knowing fully well that the Nigerian economy is largely import driven. It is often said that when the dollar sneezes, the Naira catches cold. But what has been the impact of the efforts being made by CBN to strengthen the Naira in recent times? Let's hear our in-house guest who has just joined us this morning. We have Sam Oruwujo here with us this morning as usual. Glad you have joined us. Good morning, Femi. My pleasure to be here. Good, Good morning. morning. Listen. Thank you. All right. So let's start the conversation by looking at efforts being made by the CBN to strengthen the Naira in recent times. You're aware that um, the Nigeria economy is slightly import driven. And so whatever happens to the dollar or any foreign currency affects our own era, our own local currency. Yeah. But what do you make of the efforts being made by the CBN to strengthen the Naira, given the results that we've achieved in the last one week? As of Friday, the exchange of Naira to dollar was 1,431 Naira. Your reaction to that? Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Femi. Um, those who are in the uh, foreign exchange market, um, uh, last week, uh, Friday, uh, I think uh, the Naira to dollar gained about 1.52% uh, for just that day. And consistently in the last uh, one week, uh, the Naira vis-a-vis -vis the dollar has gained about 12%. Uh, percent. So if you look at it, uh, based on that uh, kind of gain, then um, CBN has done well in terms of uh, the measures uh, put in place. The CBN itself uh, has traded over 50 million US dollars uh, in the last uh, uh, few weeks uh, within the foreign exchange market. So there's some improvement. To that extent, uh, the market watchers believe that uh, there are some gain in terms of the bol uh, policy framework that was put in place recently, but how sustainable uh, this will be uh, in the next one week uh, remain to be seen uh, if uh, we have more gains in terms of uh, Naira to dollar, then uh, we'll be in a better position to salute the uh, efforts of the CBN so far. All right, so now that uh, the Naira is appreciating against the dollar, what exactly can you, I know the CBN has uh, brought up several measures to try to strengthen the Naira. But in recent times, what could you attribute this to? One of the reasons uh, those in the market uh, advanced for this improvement is that the CBN itself was able to uh, put in uh, some more dollar into the market, so that reduced uh, the pressure. On the other hand, too, um, the supervisory framework in terms of uh, how the CBN is able to deal with the parallel market operator and those of uh, the commercial bank has improved tremendously. Those are the two major reasons that was advanced uh, for the improvement in the market for those who play uh, strongly in the market. Let's look at some of the policies or decisions made by the CBN in recent times. One of them has to be the, the decision to float the Naira and then looking at uh, the, to also regulate the activities of the parallel market. Will you say these efforts are paying off or it's too early to celebrate? The floating, uh, to a very large extent, uh, has brought some stability because there was a, uh, a wide uh, margin between the official market and the parallel market. Therefore, since the floating, uh, there have been some remarkable gain in that market. Uh, but then it's too early uh, to celebrate. Uh, like the former deputy governor of the central bank uh, said, uh, Kesley Mogalu, uh, till we get to a level between 1,000 and 1,200, 
then we can say uh, the Naira is in good shape because uh, those who are thinking of getting it at 450, 650 are not in cons uh, consonance with the current reality of the market. So the current reality of the market, as of now, the, the CBN doesn't even have much forex to even supply at the official markets. And then uh, currently, uh, Nigeria's foreign reserve is around $34 billion. So there isn't enough to support the, the, the dollars. How will this uh, move to take it down to about 1,200 or even 1,000 between the Naira and the, uh, the, the US dollar? How can it be achieved? Are there other things that need to be done to ensure that is achieved? Yes, number one, the government needs to strengthen its uh, fiscal policy and that of the policy, uh, monetary policy that has been put in place. On the other hand, the over-dependence uh, on uh, importation to a very large extent has to reduce uh, drastically so that uh, the Naira gets stronger vis-a-vis -vis the dollar because the pressure is essentially based on um, over-reliance on uh, imported item. But then on the regulatory side, uh, once uh, there is some discipline in terms of uh, the supervision of the commercial bank uh, by the CBN, then the level of success that they have achieved so far can be sustained over a period of time. Let's look at um, efforts being made to also tackle the issue of backlog of FX. Uh, the present regime inherited about $7 billion, and as I said last week, has been able to clear them. How has that impacted um, efforts to strengthen the Naira? I think the benefit is those who are doing business in Nigeria. So the confidence in terms of uh, uh, those doing business in Nigeria, since they are able to repatriate their funds, so the, the confidence will improve and that will uh, increase in terms of uh, business opportunity, particularly for those uh, companies that were operating uh, that had difficulties in repatriating their funds. So I think it's just confidence building that, uh, that has brought uh, uh, about uh, in the market. The resumption of sale of Forex to the bearded exchange operators by the CBN, do you see it as uh, also a contributory factor to the appreciation of the Naira against the dollar? You can recall uh, last month uh, the CBN equally uh, put a hammer on some of them and uh, I think they raised uh, the uh, benchmark in terms of uh, what you pay uh, to be able to get your license. Maybe to a very large extent that has sanitized uh, the market. And um, that parallel and the official regime uh, that has been brought about with the new initiative uh, will continue to sustain the market where like I mentioned earlier, where the margin was, uh, uh, was very high, then that gives room for some round tripping, uh, which was one of the bane of that market for a very long time. You're aware that uh, whatever happens in the parallel market affects, uh, of course, the timing you know, is the reality. Well, the official rate could be on paper sometimes, or not sometimes, could be what happens on paper, but the reality play out in the parallel market. But the CBN in recent time has keep highs on the parallel market. Do you see CBN sustaining that effort? And it's been, if it's being done, will it also impact on the strength of the Naira? Don't forget that the CBN also pegged, you know, uh, the exchange rate at 1,300 Naira for in FX dealings and other transactions at the parallel market. How do you see that playing out in the parallel market in months to come? Uh, the mandate of the CBN is uh, to regulate uh, uh, money supply uh, in the country. So it has a uh, mandate uh, to regulate uh, financial service, particularly on the monetary side. So what it is that they have done so far is um, they are bringing about uh, banking supervision, uh, which is one of the core rules. So once the commercial banks and other operators within the money market uh, uh, supervise, uh, then um, that will reduce some of the infraction uh, or some of the rascality that take place in the foreign exchange market. So I'm sure the current governor um, will find a way uh, to tighten this supervision. And once this supervision uh, is tightened, then there will be um, some discipline in the market and that could be sustained over a period of time. So the submission here is that um, some of the policy framework that we've put in place must be sustained in a way that um, uh, commercial banks and uh, 
the primary, uh, parallel market operator don't take advantage of uh, some of the gaps uh, that currently exist within the market. Now, uh, talking about uh, some of the measures that CBN has put in place, it did introduce uh, a new policy which demands for uh, those who will be applying for Forex for service, payment of services to turn in their tax uh, clearance certificate for at least three years. Do you also see that as a measure that will help? Or will it turn more people to the parallel market and then heighten the demand at the parallel markets? I think the challenge here is um, uh, the notice, uh, in my view, when that uh, uh, policy initiative was put in place maybe about uh, two weeks ago. I think the timeline was uh, short, in my view. So, but that will help uh, uh, to control the market to a very large extent. So, I think the CBN will have um, extended the date uh, for those Beard who do... April 1st. Uh, yes, I think the timeline is uh, short, in my view. I'm just saying that the policy framework is okay, but the timeline uh, to turn in that uh, requirement uh, may have stored uh, some of the gains uh, to a very large extent. So more people will look uh, to the parallel market if they cannot meet up uh, the requirement in terms of uh, providing uh, the uh, uh, tax uh, papers. So, but providing that tax paper, again, is to increase uh, government revenue. It's another way to say, okay, yes, you can source uh, FX, but then we need to see your task based on your company operation. But the timing uh, should be extended to a, a longer time so that that policy framework uh, can be successful. Those are my personal views. But don't you see another form of bottleneck, you know, in this kind of provision? Of course, it's to standardize the FX market and the transactions that have to do with FX. But on the other hand, reasons people patronize the parallel market is because it's the, the easy access to FX. Will this not create another kind of bottleneck whereby people will be discouraged and then they will sort back to patronizing the parallel market? In my view, I think it's just in the short term because um, uh, when you give that guideline, uh, the timeline, in my personal view, but they are the policy initiators, so they have a better window of uh, the data and what is brought on the table, but then you must uh, do stakeholder engagement. Uh, that timing is the only challenge, but in the long run, uh, I'm sure that once you're able to um, provide information uh, that are data-driven, uh, your tasks uh, properly paid, then whenever you apply uh, for the official uh, forest, you are able to get it based once your paper, so nobody can deny you. So. But then I think that initiative uh, will work out and improve equally in terms of uh, the inflow into the government uh, coffer. So over about a week, the Naira has uh, gained up about 1.52% uh, uh, against the dollar. But this is not the first time we see the Naira making gains against the dollar, but it's often not sustained. What are those factors that could reverse this growth? I think those ones were addressed earlier, uh, just to reemphasize them. Number one, uh, the CBN has to make some uh, dollar available in the market, which they have done uh, in the last uh, two weeks or thereabout. Over 50 million, uh, million US dollars dollar ha has been traded. So that's some improvement uh, uh, because there was some uh, dollar uh, cash crunch uh, on the part of the CBN. Number two, the improved supervision of uh, the commercial bank uh, and the parallel market. Um, number three, uh, showing up uh, the minimum threshold in terms of uh, uh, the borrowed the change operator and uh, some mechanism where they were able to peg uh, the Naira at setting level as help in terms of, uh, but again, uh, they will respond to the market based on demand and supply which is a normal marketing uh, framework that determines any exchange. But what are the things that could happen and reverse this growth? Now, what you talked about now are the things that the CBN needs to do. But what could happen, like we've seen before, where the Naira was appreciating and it just had a, a great slide uh, uh, falling down against the dollar 
again. I think I, think I mentioned uh, the over-reliance on uh, Im importation. So the government needs to control um, the kind of imports uh, that comes into the country. So if we do and support local production and consume uh, made in Nigerian products, uh, that will help to strengthen the Naira against the dollar. So the CBN um, must put framework in place. The banks must equally lend to the risk sector so that we can sustain uh, uh, production and productivity within the local economy rather than over uh, reliance on uh, import, which has um, often uh, weakened uh, the Naira against. All right, it's time for us to go on our first break. We'll be right back to continue our conversation in this light. Stay with us. In the heart of South Saharan Africa, where commerce meets progress, welcome to Soup News, your source for business, economy, and development insight to drive nations forward. From the vibrant streets of Lagos, Africa's fastest economic hub, Souk News takes you on a journey of discovery, analyzing and reporting the facts that lay the foundation for growth and development. We don't just report the news, we create it. Souk News is more than a channel, it is a catalyst for change, spotlighting the stories that shape economies, inspire entrepreneurs, and fear progress. Covering business, finance, technology, energy, and many more, Soup News provides a daily deep dive into the stories that matter, interviews with industry titans, and analysis that empowers your understanding of economic landscape. Join us daily as we dissect, discuss, and deliver the most relevant and factual news on business and the economy. Soup News is your trusted guide, empowering you with the knowledge to make informed decisions. We've got just what you need right here at Femi Wash Media. Call it the Midas Touch and you wouldn't be wrong. Let us record, produce, mix and master your audio like nobody does. Reach us on our contact today for the best quality job. Early exchange with Femi Ayo Daily. You know, the early exchange is all about shaping policy and advanced development with our conversation today. We're set to give you the best of programming. And blessing Aiche. We do hope that you enjoy every time you spend with us here today. The world needs peace. The world needs to come to a round table and find solutions to the pockets of troubles. Early exchange. Shaping policy, advancing development. Glad to know you're still there with us. We're still dealing with the issues that has to do with the Naira and efforts being made by the CBN to strengthen the Naira. In your own view, what do you think is the state of the Naira now? Giving the Naira outlook, will you say the effort by the CBN to strengthen the Naira is paying off? If you want to share your view, just join us on this program via our social media platform and our YouTube page. We still have our in-house guests here with us. Sam is still here with us. Platinum is still here with us. Thank you. All right. You made a statement earlier talking about uh, what the federal government needs to do to strengthen the Naira, which is to encourage local production and also see how we can patronize the Nigerian-made goods. Yes, it's a public secret. As part, we want to say that even Nigerians I agree with you. But in reality, where are we? So what should be the starting point? We often say, okay, we need to patronize Nigerian-made goods. But how visible is that? Uh, Even from the government circle, let's start from there. Uh, it's very visible. Uh, it just has to be um, a deliberate policy uh, put in place uh, by government. On the other hand, as citizens, uh, we must equally look inward uh, to support uh, the government initiative. Uh, the point here is that uh, we have always uh, accused public servants of uh, recklessness in terms of um, how they uh, spend public money. So if that discipline is coming from the president, I think I read in the papers uh, yesterday uh, uh, one of the media aides of the president saying that um, uh, the president bed is due on Friday and he has put um, a stop uh, to advertorials and all kinds of greeting. Uh, that will mark his uh, 29th birthday, saying that uh, uh, the way the country, uh, the challenge 
currently uh, does not uh, give room for that. I think that's signaling uh, some effort in terms of uh, providing leadership. So if we take that, or if that does still into uh, the government practice, where those who are the hands of affair provide some level of discipline, uh, we consume essentially what is made um, uh, in the country. Even the president uh, in recent uh, um, media scan has equally say ministers and other direct aids of his government uh, must reduce uh, foreign trips. These are some of the um, elements uh, that we have on the government side. And as citizens, uh, our patient uh, for luxury goods uh, based on import should equally reduce. I think is uh, messaging and uh, we must uh, redirect our effort to see how uh, we can be our own brother's keeper by patronizing uh, goods that are made uh, within Nigeria. When that is done uh, within a short time, then this um, exchange uh, issue uh, will reduce uh, drastically. All right, so um, the um, Forex report also says that uh, within a week, uh, liquidity at the market uh, actually improved because um, there was daily turnover of $199.7 million, culminating in a total turnover of $1 billion in one week alone. Diaspora meetings is for uh, direct investment in oil, improving liquidity. How can we sustain this? We know we still have uh, many of our brothers and sisters remitting, but and those who also want to bring in forex into the economy. How can we encourage more? Uh, more will come when we have uh, fiscal discipline and uh, monetary discipline. So uh, some of the monetary framework that has been put uh, up by the CBN, once they are sustained, once the supervisions are sustained, then there will be improvement uh, in terms of uh, the foreign exchange market. In terms of inflow, uh, once uh, there's a political stability, more uh, foreign direct investment will come in. And once that uh, comes in, that will energize the economy and will reflect the economy. Then the issues of uh, uh, the forest, uh, to a very large extent, uh, will reduce. As a follow-up to the question I asked earlier in respect to your response, I need to know, how do we get there? What kind of intervention is needed? We're talking about made in Nigerian goods. For instance, I'm looking at what could be done to encourage Nigerians to start taking Nigerian rice or fada instead of patronizing the one from Thailand and the foreign one. What would make Nigeria to stop looking for over, uh, cars made overseas? You have cars being assembled or to an extent assembled or being manufactured in Nigeria. So what kind of deliberate intervention is needed to encourage the patronage for our locally made goods, which is what can strengthen the economy, as we've agreed? Uh, number one uh, is lending to uh, the small and medium enterprise, uh, which is the engine of growth. So government needs to provide uh, incentives uh, to grow that sector. Uh, number two, uh, let's not talk about uh, cars. Uh, let's even talk about uh, the rice that you mentioned. Uh, even toothpick. Let's start from there. Yeah. Uh, let's leave the uh, toothpick metaphor uh, that we used to describe uh, over reliance on uh, uh, imports. Uh, some toothpick might come in, but people manufacture toothpick here. But uh, the point I'm trying to make, uh, some of the rice uh, that are currently consumed in Nigeria are actually uh, Nigerian rice. But uh, regrettably, uh, because of the uh, competitiveness, uh, some of those rice are branded as if they are foreign rice. Uh, this uh, uh, what uh, some market uh, uh, analysts have said. So the point is that, um, like I mentioned uh, in one of our programs in the previous week, uh, we need to practice the concept of continuous improvement. So some of these countries that would patronize uh, at some point had uh, some challenge in terms of uh, uh, their production processes. So let's encourage uh, made in Nigeria uh, goods. Let's strengthen the value chains in terms of uh, those who are into agriculture. Uh, the insecurity must be reduced uh, to some extent. So 
if we take a holistic approach in terms of um, physical discipline, monetary discipline, discipline even as citizens uh, that will consume um, our own product rather than uh, going over the border uh, to smuggle uh, stop stand, uh, substandard goods sometime uh, into the country. And again, the local uh, companies cannot compete with some of these uh, dumped items into the country. So we need that patriotism to be able to get to that level and sustain it. Apart from patriotism, what about on the side of the local manufacturers improving quality and ensuring standard? Because people want value for their money. Yes, I just spoke to that. that while uh, we have a pension uh, for consuming uh, some goods from the outside, some of our products are not really bad as we paint them. But then there's a need uh, to improve on the quality of what we manufacture locally. So we have a uh, regulatory uh, environment that's supposed to supervise. So standard organization, NAVDAC, uh, should improve on their regulatory framework and find a way um, uh, to celebrate uh, some of those manufacturing uh, companies that are engaged in what you call GMP, good manufacturing practices, in a way that uh, you can encourage uh, the people that are doing well in the market, and that will encourage uh, more people to consume uh, those goods. So it's a two-way traffic, government on the other hand, then even consumer must equally believe in those products. So, But if you not consume substandard, uh, substandard uh, goods, then you equally have uh, those regulatory framework that supports you. So you make um, complaints uh, to the Consumer Protection Council, uh, some state has, then they will have the federal government to be able to uh, uh, put in check uh, those who don't meet up uh, with uh, good uh, manufacturing practices. All right, now away from the issue of the Naira, let's look at um, the Nigeria Morocco gas pipeline project to the tune of $25 billion. Um, the essence of that is to connect uh, these countries. It's going to pass through about 13 African countries to connect Africa to Europe. And then it's expected by December that this will kick off officially. And the NMPC and Nigerian government, that of Morocco, has made commitment to this. What do you make of this project? The first question an average Nigerian will ask is, what is the significance of this $25 billion gas pipeline? Uh, thank you very much indeed, Femi. Um, uh, Mele Kari uh, made uh, this observation uh, in uh, a conference in Texas uh, during, uh, last week. But the point is that uh, this has been an ongoing um, investment in terms of uh, taking natural gas uh, from Nigeria. Uh, that will cut across uh, about 12 African countries, uh, particularly uh, some countries uh, within the ECOWAS sub-region. So uh, a memorandum of understanding uh, was signed far back in September 2022 uh, to push this uh, energy agenda. But then you have uh, the Republic of Benin, uh, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, the Guinea, and some other African countries that are interested in this uh, uh, gas pipeline. So the estimate of about 25 billion US dollar is meant to complete uh, uh, that project to take gas uh, particularly to Europe. So the importance of this and the significance of this is um, uh, that will reduce um, over dependence on the fossil fuel and uh, that will help uh, to a very large extent in transiting to other energy regime then this country uh, that, that are contiguous uh, to the pipeline uh, to Europe will equally benefit. So in the long run, once this project is, is, is put through, then we are going to end some uh, reasonable foreign exchange uh, from natural gas in addition to what comes from uh, the liqu uh, liquefied gas uh, project as well. So it is a good initiative. Uh, the project has been ongoing and the various countries, uh, including Morocco, uh, has signed a memorandum of understanding. And I'm sure the final disbursement uh, is what uh, Mele Kari was saying that will happen in December. And I think it's a good initiative. And uh, in the long run, uh, the country will benefit uh, from this project. 
This is a lot of projects, but let's look at where it began from. Now, Nigeria actually wanted to do this collaboration with Niger, but uh, because of the frosty relationship between Nigeria and the Niger Republic, it switched to Morocco and all. Do you think if it has sustained uh, that uh, uh, collaboration with Niger, it will cost less or it will be easier to do that going through Niger rather than going through 13 African countries and then to Morocco before the Europe? And I think the challenge here is just a business decision. Uh, if uh, a project was supposed to take place between uh, two countries and the project did not get through, I think we should not worry ourselves so much about what happened between Nigeria and Niger. What is important is that uh, that project uh, would benefit more African countries and that partnership has reduced uh, uh, the burden on Nigeria uh, as a country if you have 12 other African countries, in addition to Nigeria, we should make it about 13 countries, uh, including Morocco, to get this gas uh, out of uh, Nigeria. I think it's more beneficial in terms of um, the benefit to the sub-region and uh, taking the gas pipeline uh, across uh, uh, the sub sahara to Sahara to Europe would benefit more people. And I'm sure that um, the revenue receivable uh, from that project would be more uh, if we are taking it to Niger. Uh, these are just my uh, personal observation in that uh, uh, regard. So these more countries uh, that are signing into the project, uh, like they say, the more the merrier. Now let's look at the business side of it, you know, which is always our preference. You know, talking about this 7,000 kilometer project, how is it going to impact the locals or the local economy? When I mean the locals, the artisans, talking about local content, what kind of narrative would you expect in as regards this project to make provisions for local artisans who could also be beneficiaries of this kind of project? Yeah, and how will it impact the local economy? You know, to improve on uh, the rate of employment uh, in terms of technology transfer, uh, that will improve on the, uh, uh, on the locals. There's already a local content uh, uh, regulatory framework uh, that supports uh, welding uh, infrastructure that you have to be dependent on the uh, local labor. So that will enhance that. The direct and the indirect um, uh, opportunity that will come uh, from that uh, project is enormous. And, and, and I'm sure that uh, that, that uh, project will equally employ some Nigerian, even in other countries, in addition to the locals of those countries that are partners. And I'm sure in that MOU, uh, there are some components uh, beyond the financial uh, uh, commitment in terms of uh, labor content, in terms of indirect labor that will benefit uh, uh, the 13 country uh, citizens by the time we finally get to Morocco and get on to Europe. So I think the benefit is, uh, is, is enormous. And I think the expectations uh, and December is just around the corner. And I'm sure the project is already ongoing. So I'm sure that in terms of um, getting the final tranches of uh, uh, the investment uh, will happen in December. So this market that Nigeria and uh, the other 12 African countries in partnership with Nigeria for this Nigeria Morocco gas project eyes is Europe. But do you see Nigeria and even uh, Morocco being able to meet the, ta the, the, the demands of the market because uh, Nigeria exported just 7 million metric tons of liquefied natural gas to Europe in 2023 uh, according to data from S&P Global and it went down from 9.06 million metric tons in 2022. So, uh, but looking at the crude oil situation, even OPEC quarter that there are still struggles to meet it. Now for gas, when the market opens, the capacity to meet the demand of the market. What are you taking it? I think the capacity to meet uh, market demand uh, uh, is there. Uh, I'm sure they have done their uh, uh, market visibility, uh, visibility studies and market viability studies. Uh, the financials uh, will have been looked to. But then we have great reserve of uh, natural gas. Is the exploitation of those gas. I'm sure that uh, this uh, Nigeria-Morocco um, uh, partnership 
we improve on the uh, unexploited natural gas reserve that we have. And I'm sure that they, they'll be able to meet up with the demand. And I'm sure before uh, this kind of uh, 25 billion uh, US dollar commitment can be made to a project, I'm sure the market reality and the market studies, uh, market research in terms of the financial viability, in terms of sustenance of the business will have been done uh, appropriately. And I'm sure uh, the partners uh, will benefit tremendously from this project. Like you said, Nigeria has one of the largest gas reserves in the world, uh, and, and presently we export, you know, through the Bonnier Energy Plant and that of Chevron. But do you think this pipeline, if it's in is in gear, is going to also help Nigeria to maximize its gas reserves? And then the issue of gas flaring will be a thing of the past. That's exactly what I mentioned earlier. Once um, uh, one of the challenge. Uh, uh, was market opportunity and uh, this market opportunity will improve on the efficiency in terms of uh, how they deploy natural gas um, which we have in great reserve so this is just one uh, market opportunity that will help to sustain and i'm sure in terms of um, uh, market research uh, those factors has been built in into uh, that scenario so uh, the challenge we have currently is that um, the development of uh, the natural gas sector uh, has not been uh, at a high point level. So this one uh, new market uh, will increase in terms of uh, the development of that uh, market. And like I mentioned earlier, that will help in terms of how we can uh, tap in into some other markets once it's be uh, become successful. Mind you, this is even done in partnership uh, with the West African uh, gas pipeline, who's already taking some gas into some other uh, African countries. So this will improve on the market efficiency of uh, that company as well, and the volume of uh, gas uh, that um, will be supplied to the Cotiguas country on that pipeline uh, will be far-reaching in terms of uh, benefits. So what would be the implication of this in terms of energy availability in Africa and these countries on route, uh, this project? Now that you have a pipeline um, uh, that is connecting about uh, 13 Afri African countries, uh, the benefit here is that uh, those countries uh, that are partners will feed in into that uh, 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 gas pipeline and that will supply additional gas to some industry with those uh, countries. So the volume in terms of consumption, we increase exponentially and that will result uh, in uh, financial gains for all the partners and which will benefit even uh, energy consumption in those uh, various countries. Mind you, uh, some, uh, now that we have a mini grid opportunity in Nigeria, where those uh, uh, gas uh, call it, there may be other feeder uh, to those that can supply gas to some other mini grids, even within Nigeria. And that we improve on the energy consumption uh, that we currently uh, have challenge with. You know, given the experience that we've had in Nigeria, are you really bothered about um, the security mechanism that should be put in place to protect this kind of pipelines? And then the locals or the communities that are going to host this project, you know, it's going to pass through like 13 African countries. Are you worried about their welfare and what should be done in this kind of MOU to ensure that you have proper security for those pipelines and then the plight or the welfare of the host communities are also protected? Uh, within the context of uh, Nigeria, uh, there's already the um, Petroleum Industry Act, uh, which takes cognizance of uh, host community. Uh, the concept of host community has been so enlarged that uh, whether you are a contiguous state in terms of uh, mineral exploitation, whether pipelines are passing through your, uh, your community, then you will get some benefits. In that regard, therefore, uh, uh, the surveillance mechanism of NNPC in terms of how they contract uh, security of those pipelines is already in place, and the host communities uh, have a responsibility, as it were, uh, to protect uh, the pipeline that passes through those communities based on uh, the promissory notes uh, of uh, whose community benefits in that regard. But then the other countries equally have a framework 
uh, that will take cognizance of uh, uh, the security framework. But the only worry based on the current oil theft uh, uh, in the Niger Delta, uh, there's a need uh, to secure those pipelines for that. So stakeholder engagement in terms of uh, the beginning of this uh, uh, project must be taken uh, seriously and all the necessary uh, standard operating procedure in terms of where those gas, uh, gas pipeline pass through uh, must be open to the community so that they can secure them appropriately. So this is a mega project. If this comes through, what would it mean going forward for regional cooperation and trade in Africa? Uh, this is a big celebration. Uh, if about uh, 13 African countries, uh, Africa is just about 54 countries and you have a 13 country already having um, a partnership uh, in terms of um, energy, then I think it speaks uh, volume that even within that uh, uh, framework that currently exists with this uh, pipeline, I'm sure some other country that needs energy supply might want to drop further memorandum of understanding uh, to tap into those uh, projects, in my view. And that's once that comes to fusion, some other partnership, some other MOU will come up to take advantage of that uh, uh, mega project. All right. I think we just have to leave the conversation here. Uh, let's hope that uh, if this project takes off in December, uh, Nigerians, not just Nigerians, by extension, Africa. It's already an, an ongoing project I, uh, in your, terms of drawing down some of the... Uh, I'm, I'm the, talking about the official kickoff mm -hmm. of, of the oil commissioning mm -hmm. so yes. that once it's there, people can feel the impact and then we'll have cause to celebrate once again. It will be a big project for Africa to come together. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, you've really given your intervention, and that's quite appreciated. Thank you for your time and your commitment. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Let's go on this short break now. When we return, we'll look at something else. It's the Early Exchange, your favorite program. Stay with us. We've got just what you need right here at Femi Wash Media. Call it the Midas Touch, and you wouldn't be wrong. Let us record, produce, mix, and master your audio like nobody does. Reach us on our content today for the best quality job. Tafao Balewa Square, TBS. Tafao Balewa Square was initially used as a housing ground called Lagos Race Course. The edifice was constructed by General Yakubu Gowan in 1972 and named after Nigeria's first Prime Minister, Saad Tafar Balewa. Tafar Balewa Square is located at 45-57 Masi Bangboshe Street on Lagos Island, Lagos and referred to as TBS. TBS is a 50,000-seater capacity venue and houses the Remembrance Arcade the 26-story Independence House, which at the time was the country's tallest building. When Lagos served as the country's seat of government, the National Assembly Complex was within the TBS. Also in the square of the National Broadcasting Commission Office, the Nigerian Hydrological Services Agency Office, shopping centers, travel agencies, restaurants, car parking lots, and a bus terminal. Safar Balewa Square is adorned with beautiful statues of white horses and red eagles, symbols of strength and dignity. Our historic neighbors include the King's College and the Holy Cross Cathedral. Safar Balewa Square hosted some of the country's memorable events such as the Independence Day in 1960 when Nigeria gained independence from Britain the Armed Forces Remembrance Day, which is celebrated annually on January 15. The edifice is a national cultural asset. Tafa Balewa Square. Souk Enlightenment. In the heart of South Saharan Africa, where commerce meets progress, welcome to Souk News, your source for business, economy, and development insight that drive nations forward. From the vibrant streets of Lagos, Africa's fastest economic hub, Souk News takes you on a journey of discovery, analyzing and reporting the facts that lay the foundation for growth and development. We don't just report the news, we create it. 
Soup News is more than a channel. It is a catalyst for change, spotlighting the stories that shape economies, inspire entrepreneurs, and fear progress. Covering business, finance, technology, energy, and many more, Soup News provides a daily deep dive into the stories that matter, interviews with industry titans, and analysis that empowers your understanding of economic landscape. Join us daily as we dissect, discuss, and deliver the most relevant and factual news on business and the economy. Soup News is your trusted guide, empowering you with the knowledge to make informed decisions. The challenge of governance is to see how we can leverage what is on the ground and convert this to wealth for the people. Russia, China are gaining entry into Africa and it would appear that some Western countries are losing out. You're working as an expatriate worker, then you're paid in your currency. But then if you must spend those money, you need to convert those money to the local currency to spend. For social security to work, we need to know exactly how many we are. We don't have a precise number. We need to know exact location of people. When we address this exchange rate volatility, we will see definitely cost of goods and services will come down. From a security point of view, we should employ the technology to ensure that we can track individuals and goods uh, within the continent. These this early exchange with Femi Ayodele. You know, the early exchange is all about shaping policy and advanced development with our conversation today. We are set to give you the best of programming. And blessing Aiche. But they hope that you enjoy every time you spend it all here today. The world needs peace. The world needs to come to a round table and find solutions to the pockets of troubles. Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development. Good to know you're still with us on Early Exchange. It's time for us to take a trip to India where peace meetings have been ongoing uh, between India and the U.S. trying to resolve some of its trade disputes. Joining us on this conversation uh, virtually would be Dr. Raju, uh, who is uh, an ex-advisor to the United Nations, ex-vice chancellor, uh, Chancellor Emeritus, founder and director, War Development Foundation, World Energy Forum. He's also an Indian, so he's the right person to speak to us about the reconciliation move between India and U.S. regarding some of its uh, trade disputes, about seven of them. So, uh, let's bring in Dr. Raju now. Good morning, Dr. Raju. Good morning. How are you guys doing in Nigeria? We're good in Nigeria. How are you? Yeah, super. There is uh, some kind of a, uh, you know, a transmission delay. I hope we can uh, get over it. Okay, but we can hear you clearly, and um, it's good now. All right, so let's kick off the conversation. India and the U.S. moving to settle some of its trade disputes. Now, one of them happens to be the ban of um, poultry products uh, from the U.S. by India uh, during the avian flu uh, um, period at a time where there was bird flu and uh, India got scared and banned products uh, for poultry products from the U.S. and some other uh, trade issues. What is... Um, actually the reason for this move to settle some of the trade disputes between the US and India. Yes, let me begin by saying that uh, India has been a country which follows uh, all the international rules and regulations and uh, the suggestions and also the international politics. So what happened was this is a case where, uh, which was uh, brought up in 2011. And after that, uh, there were intense negotiations between uh, the uh, US and also India. But what happens is uh, when there's such a huge body of uh, negotiators are involved, uh, they definitely have a very thorough way of uh, 
uh, discussions and then uh, eventually coming with uh, all kinds of technicalities involved. And uh, so this has taken a lot more time than what was really required. And uh, that is what is my feeling. And then the there are other disputes uh, which were uh, subsequent to that. And uh, some of them were uh, tit for tat kind of an issue. But uh, along with uh, uh, the burp, uh, you know, the, the chicken issue, every other big issue also has been resolved. That's a good news. I must uh, admit uh, there are a lot more than what we generally see. Uh, there are a lot of hidden factors which we can discuss as we go along. Please. All right, good to see you again, Dr. Raju. Um, I'd like you to give us a little background to the position of India as you guess this trade this sport. Um, we are aware that a few months ago uh, there were certain concerns that were raised. And now what has changed now that uh, there's a resolution? I would also like you to give details about these seven areas uh, where they resolved this trade dispute and what are these sensitive decisions being taken by these two nations? Yes. Uh, the single most important factor which has resolved disputes is the willingness of both the parties, that is U.S. and India, to come to solutions to solve these problems. And it is also a kind of a, a challenge uh, to the bureaucracy on both sides of the ocean, whereby they were more technically interested to bring up this, uh, these seven disputes into resolution by discussions at the WTO. But then they realized that uh, the mechanisms set in by the multilateral agencies are good when they are all affecting many, many countries. When it is one-to-one, -one, it is better resolved at the one-to-one -one level. So I think the single most and the critical point was the meeting by this uh, sidelines of G20, by the leader of the US and the leader of India, where it was resolved to resolve this. So they agreed and they said, they said this has to be sorted out very soon because the aviation flu is almost non-existent and there is no point in discussing which country has it and whether the surrounding countries also have it. These are two technical matters which were relevant at the point of raising the complaint. But then over the period, they all get dis, uh, you know, dissolved and disappeared. So that's what has happened to this uh, set of uh, disputes. And then the second thing is, India has a very, very strong uh, poultry industry. So obviously the pressure internally for the government not to settle import of uh, uh, poultry products from the US has prevailed upon for time. But at the same time, uh, people at the uh, uh, right levels, they have realized that there is no point in trying to pick up your defenses, whereas when somebody else puts his own defense, you have no choice. So it, it was almost like a tit-for-tat situation. So once the political level, they understood this, and all the cobs, uh, cobwebs have been cleared, and then uh, they decided to resolve it in two months, and that's exactly what has happened. Even though the Indian lobby of the poultry uh, industry is still the same, but uh, when you are exposed to competition from not only in India but also overseas, they, now the uh, you know the whole accent is you want to export to my country, then I'm going to export to your country. It is not that you want to export to my country, then I'm going to stop you. And the other guy says no. If you want to export to my country, I'm going to... No, no, I'm not talking about chicken. Uh, I can export anything else. No, no, he said, no, you cannot do that. I don't want to import uh, very, uh, the ones which are going to hurt my local industries. So these dialogues have been gone, going on for too long a period. And that has uh, completely been uh, set right. And then uh, obstacles have been removed. My usual example uh, is... Uh, uh, even in uh, Nigeria, uh, the question of uh, having a circle in between the roads for all the vehicles will be 
uh, uh, you know, moving around that. And if uh, it, it goes as long as the traffic is smooth. But if somebody stops a vehicle or it breaks down and it becomes a kind of a block on which the entire traffic in all the four, di four directions will stop and somebody has to remove that obstacle, so an external party, because everything is jammed and no vehicle can go inside to pull that out and things like that. So there may be a crane that is really required. That's exactly what has happened. The meeting between uh, President Biden and then Prime Minister Modi was that a rescue mission. And they said, look, we are, both the countries are losing because, uh, you know, we could have increased our trade. And as they said, uh, the tempo has uh, improved and uh, nearly seven to eight percent of the mutual trade has uh, uh, gone up. And then uh, people are now understanding by uh, trading more between nations, everybody benefits. This is a basic theory of international trade theory. I'm a, a person from the international business. And what the first lesson is uh, to learn uh, why nations should trade. So this is, this is the, they went to the fundamentals. They said you cannot be restrictive. And uh, the second point which has really come about is, you know, when we talk about massive organizations like WTO, of which I'm also a, a, not a direct part, but certainly I'm connected with that is that uh, uh, I'm uh, from the uh, ITC Geneva, International Trade Center Geneva, which is the executive arm of uh, UNCTAD WTO. Uh, so WTO is part and parcel of our DNA. I used to work for uh, the uh, uh, sister organization or a daughter organization, you must say. So there we realize it is nice to have uh, 193 members sitting at uh, in a huge hall and discussing uh, oh, this is a resolution that has to be done and this is status and then <clears throat> the director general gives the report and then again next uh, meeting again the same thing comes up and it has not been resolved. So this becomes a very important point for everybody to look at and then say, look, we have to resolve it. That was a, diff a kind of a difference. When we said we have to resolve it and that's what they have resolved it. That is, that, I think that is a key uh, issue. But there are, uh, I want to just go over the other uh, uh, disputes, primarily when we talked about the poultry, then there are uh, other issues which are on uh, the US tariffs on uh, steel and aluminum products from India. That was uh, one of the disputes, which again got resolved. And uh, this was, in my opinion, I'm not a party to the uh, discussions, uh, nor I'm from the uh, Indian government uh, uh, activities. But I must say that uh, from the outside, when we look at this has uh, been one of the uh, uh, tit for tat uh, uh, program. Then the third one was uh, the, uh, uh, it has appealed, that was the third uh, uh, point. US has appealed again against the US, uh, the US retaliatory tariffs. The fourth one was about Indian subsidies for solar cells and modules under Jain National Solar Mission. So what happens is when you uh, mix the domestic politics and then overseas politics, this really uh, ch changes the entire scenario. Uh, because of uh, the Indian government's interest uh, to uh, ensure that a lot more industries, a lot more individuals start using uh, solar cells for power generation, at the local level, uh, but unfortunately, what really happened is that is constru construed to be a sort of an indirect subsidy for India to export its solar cells. So this again uh, became a point of contention. And uh, uh, India, what it did do is to have complained against these things again. So that became a separate dispute item. And uh, U.S. gave another counter-retaliatory measure of saying that India is uh, giving a lot of export subsidies and which uh, they are linking up with this solar cell program, which was basically a domestic one. And then the seventh one was uh, uh, India's uh, uh, position regarding the countervailing duty on hot-rolled uh, carbon flats produced uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the U.S. So what happens is uh, when you say you will put export duty, you will put import duty. That uh, kind of uh, uh, disturbs the real scene, the pricing scene, 
and also what way the trade has to happen. So this becomes very important when uh, you have a, a large uh, uh, imports and exports, big ticket items. Uh, the better senses prevail to resolve disputes that have been pending so long. So what is a lesson for everybody and particularly Nigeria and other African countries? It is a trend that you are seeing that uh, people are shedding their multilateralism and going on a bilateralism. I don't want to name countries, but uh, essentially they are uh, abrogating the treaties, what they have uh, done in the international manner. And then they say, look, we are going to do it on our own, the way we want. So, in fact, even uh, regime change has uh, complicated the matter so much. And then the certain regimes have uh, made agreements secretly with uh, 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 government players, but uh, uh, maybe out of compulsions to show the public that they are doing something or... Uh, Eventually, the, the, the international bodies uh, find out and then it becomes a very bad uh, situation. Uh, for instance, uh, the question of uh, taking loans and uh, things from, again, I don't want to name names, uh, from a particular country and then uh, not uh, uh, included in the national accounts. And then uh, it becomes a, a sore thumb in, uh, when you settle the IMF and uh, World Bank dues and things like that. So this becomes an out-of-the-balance sheet item. That's exactly what has happened when they realize it is of no use to continue the, uh, uh, you know, the, the disputes and we must resolve. And that's what really happened. So the resolution will come only when there is a political will and there is a need. And then people realize the uh, benefits of uh, doing international trade and then they want to continue and then ensure that it really helps. So these are the seven disputes, including the, the, basically it's a chicken dispute. It's a very small dispute. It's not a massive one, you know. That's it's really, it's really funny how you put in and Dr. So Raju as chicken resolved. dispute so because most of the disputes that have been resolved yeah. center right. around poultry products. Now, um, India is U.S. ninth largest trading partner in 2022 alone. Uh, the U.S. sold goods and services worth $73.1 billion to India. But uh, the U.S. have had uh, market access concerns with India as India has imposed some restrictions in forms of tariffs. But what is it about India that makes it still an attractive market, an attractive investment destination for the U.S.? Right. I think uh, you touched a very vital point and thanking you for that. Uh, basically, India is the uh, uh, upcoming uh, world economy and where there is uh, everything that can be done from the USA and from other uh, countries which are wanting to have a slice of the pie. So India has done its marketing very well all over the globe, telling about the, uh, you know, the, the uh, what do you call the... Uh, demographic dividend because our population is very young and then uh, there is so much demand is going on and so on and so forth. So uh, people are looking at from every country. And this also helps India in a very indirect way. When we talked about the bilateralism, one important point we must remember is that India also has a tradition of uh, uh, dealing bilaterally with many countries. This is part of the uh, uh, post-independence scenario where India was considered to be a socialistic country. So what happened was most of the countries, particularly the communist bloc, uh, the Soviet bloc, they never had the foreign exchange, uh, free foreign exchange like dollar and so on and so forth. But they were having goods and services which were really needed in uh, territories. So it became a matter of convenience for India to deal bilaterally. And that tradition continues even till date because India is one of the largest importer of petroleum products, oil from uh, the USSR and uh, now uh, the Russia. So obviously what happens is governments are using the available mechanisms uh, in a way that it suits them because eventually they have to keep the local politics go uh, in a very smooth manner. And then there should not be any political hindrance for the uh, ruling party to uh, uh, provide uh, the benefits, what they promise to the public. 
and then the second thing is they also have to see the progress and the positioning of uh, countries like india in the international uh, uh, markets so i think it has really worked well uh, basically india has been marketed very well and that is my uh, feeling and it will continue to do so it's a very large market for any product from anywhere in the world and uh, uh, it, it is time that we can talk about the other countries which are having a good uh, 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 trade with india for very many items uh, so they find the growing market the easiness with which they can import because the rules are already set and we are part of the india is part of the uh, many multilateral uh, rule setting bodies and uh, india is considered to be a very peaceful nation so and also a very rule bound nation so when somebody is uh, exporting something out here they are 100% sure that they will get the money whatever has been promised through the confirmed letter of credit without recourse to the buyers and uh, all of those things which are already existing so you know that kind of a mechanism makes uh, any country to be happy with dealing with uh, uh, india and that will continue to be there for a long long time to come yeah all right it's interesting to know that um, this this sports have been resolved but i learned the us is you know uh, the us asks for compensation from india as a result of uh, lateness in implementing this decision give us update on this what's the position of india as regards this compensation and what's the latest development I think uh, uh, Indian, uh, I am not privy to those uh, internal discussions as yet, but uh, uh, there could be a mechanism uh, by which uh, the international settlements uh, can happen. Uh, for instance, when we talk about the carbon fund, uh, you know, there is a very good example available. The settlement mechanisms have to be uh, taken care. I am sure at the highest level, the government is working on that then uh, anything that will uh, uh, be uh, based on the rules and regulations of WTO will be followed because uh, India is one of the prominent members of the WTO and then uh, whatever India does will be uh, seen by everybody, uh, whether India itself is following or not following. So it will it'll follow the rules and regulations. I'm 100% sure about that. But the discussions are ongoing. And uh, the, the uh, when we, it, it's like a family dispute. When husband and wife uh, decide uh, that, uh, you know, the disputes can be solved and then they come to an amicable solution. So all these small matters will be just thrown out. And if anybody is trying to create third party, fourth party, they will be butchered, you know, that's how it is. So discussions are actively on and in every aspect of the compensation and so on and so forth. And uh, the highest level are working. To my mind, it is still not uh, sorted out, so sooner or later it will be. It's about the, the largest uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, the, it's about the country that brings in the largest amount of foreign direct investment into India. And so sitting together with India to settle trade disputes, how do you think they can do more trade with each other? from the uh, resolutions that have come between India and the U.S. What can boast uh, more trade between the two countries? Yeah, uh, this is also a very important point. Uh, what we discussed so far is about the history and uh, geography, but we are, we are talking about the future. And I believe, uh, uh, you know, the future is very, very bright. The collaboration with uh, India by the U.S. will happen at all levels because these are very large democratic countries of the world. And whatever they do uh, certainly is the example for everybody else to follow. And uh, there is a sizable uh, you know, expatriate community of Indians in the United Nations, sorry, United States. And then uh, they are all very keen on uh, encouraging the uh, uh, you know, the two-way uh, investment promotion and so on and so forth. Uh, there are many organizations which are doing this uh, to promote USA into uh, uh, India and India into the USA. So I believe the current uh, uh, scenario will change for the better. 
and uh, US has uh, too many things to offer, particularly in the way in which India is doing these solar cells and then uh, putting up these semiconductor plants and so on and so forth, and then uh, also buying the aircraft from uh, the Boeing and things like that. So this will considerably increase its uh, uh, exports to India in all manner of speaking. And in that, investment is one vital part because uh, when you put money into the, uh, uh, you know, the projects and then when you start, obviously there are a lot more things which can be imported from the U.S. in terms of plant, machinery, technology, know-how, and so on and so forth. So my uh, feeling is that investments in the U.S. will increase many, many folds and not only in software, which is uh, the current uh, favorite, but also in every conceivable field. And then um, U.S. Uh, uh, will find it uh, easy for it to uh, send money and then take back the money because rules and regulations and the procedures are very well set in India. So ease of doing business is what is going to make a difference. And that is what uh, India is uh, pushing very hard for. And many visits by uh, the Prime Minister Modi and also the Foreign Minister, the Industry Minister, India is taking part in all the important forums, investment uh, summits and so on and so forth. So that uh, keeps uh, the tempo moving in the section in which uh, both countries want. All right. Now that... Um... India and the U.S., you know, they've resolved this dispute and officially they've informed the World Trade Organization of these decisions. What will be the role of WTO and your expectations from this body as regards this dispute or this resolution of this dispute? The United Nations, of which I was associated for the past so many decades, uh, uh, is uh, to give a kind of a steel frame for the world to be there as an entity. Otherwise, uh, with all the 17 SDGs, uh, you know, there are no other entities which are interested in the existence and the future of the world as much as the United Nations or its own bodies like WTO. So WTO will definitely continue to play a kind of a, a you know honest broker in all these discussions and negotiations. And uh, but one very important fallout of the whole thing is, uh, in my opinion, I've got no confirmation from any of these uh, institutions, even though I take part, uh, is that definitely WTO also will learn from why such resolutions are taking so much time in spite of its own uh, bookkeeping and record keeping. It has to play an active role. So they may take, uh, sorry, they may take uh, a number of uh, uh, measures which will reduce the time delays. One important thing is by design or default, UN organizations have reduced their headcount. Uh, that, that is not the way it was earlier. So obviously, that is one uh, important thing that has happened. Second thing is the induction of uh, IT and software within the working of the UN organizations also has speedified things. If something was uh, taking 10 years earlier, now with these two factors, things are going to take maybe one year uh, to uh, you know, be resolved. But the third one, the impending danger is that why we require a WTO or AFCFTA if we cannot get everybody to be a member of the uh, organization and then if everybody is not collaborating to solve the issues, then why should we have these organizations? That thinking is going on within the hierarchies of all the multilateral organizations and uh, it should not be that uh, 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 they miss the main point. They have to take this how to cut down delays, how to make uh, people feel that uh, we are uh, uh, the resolving bodies, not the troublemaking bodies, you know. But the right thinking is on. So you may have to wait for some more uh, interesting announcements from uh, WTO and connected organizations, including AFCFT, I'm sure. 
Let's look at the situation between the U.S. and China. In the case of U.S. and India, uh, they have been able to resolve all trade disputes. But we see an ongoing trade war between the U.S. and China that never ceases to end. What is the difference and what can uh, U.S. and China learn from how the U.S. and India have resolved their trade disputes? I think uh, um, I, I'm, it is that fair on me to comment on China. Absolutely not correct. But still, this is a forum and we are discussing openly. And uh, your interest is to see that uh, how uh, at uh, such situations things can be settled. Uh, my own feeling is that, uh, uh, you know, China is a very tough negotiator. And uh, that's uh, one that has really brought them to this uh, scale and size in such a short period. Uh, for instance, uh, at the time of uh, independence in 1947, India and China were virtually at the same level of economic, uh, uh, you know, uh, prosperity. But uh, see, whereas uh, China has gone into a really a faster spin, whereas India has been moving slowly. Of course, you may counter me by saying the race between the uh, rabbit and uh, also the tortoise. Uh, but uh, that's not a good anecdote to bring up here. But fundamentally, what I'm saying is, China has been negotiating very, very strongly with America. They have to uh, uh, sort of give in. Uh, that's my, my observation. I'm not even competent to advise China about that. But that is my wish. Because uh, in international theory, trade theory, what we know for sure is that Everybody benefits if two nations trade. Everybody benefits in their own way, but it's a big, a big theory which I don't want to explain. But fundamentally, that is the consideration with which uh, China should work. China should be ready to resolve all the institutions, uh, uh, you know, situations, and then uh, enable uh, America to export more into China because uh, American exports, I believe, is more into investments. Uh, into factories like Apple and Tesla and uh, all of these things. And uh, there are so many restrictions. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> the whole thing started, the prosperity also started taking the uh, uh, top gear when, uh, uh, you know, Zheng Jinping uh, had, uh, uh, you know, really made an open China policy. So I think uh, in the ascendance of China, uh, the policies of USA has helped a lot. And then that is what they should also be happy about. And then uh, they should know that uh, if uh, the US uh, is happy with Chinese uh, policies on uh, uh, importation and also investments, so obviously that will benefit not only China, not only the US, everybody else. Because there are so many subcontractors, vendors for China. When we call uh, China as the workshop of the world, but it is not so. There are so many vendors which are around uh, China, like Thailand, Vietnam, uh, North Korea, Russia. Everybody puts their own uh, stuff and then actually the product emerges and then it reaches the shores of the US. So everybody benefits. So I think uh, time, and this uh, should be a good example uh, for China also to follow that if India can benefit, why not us? Because they're very, very competitive, spirited, uh, you know, country. Certainly, I'm sure uh, somewhere in uh, Beijing, uh, they're sitting and uh, strategizing, oh, this is what has happened. What about us? You know, I'm sure. But it is good for everybody if they solve this. Raju, what a way to wrap up this conversation. We feel like extending this conversation because uh, it's been quite productive, but we just have to wrap up now. And we need to thank you for your time and your submission. You know, this is coming from an ex-advisor to the United Nations. No doubt you had the right mind for, the, for this kind of conversation. Thank you for your time, Dr. Raju. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. Take care. Bye. All right, it's the early exchange where we shape policy and advance development with our conversation. I'm always proud to say that because that's our obligation on this show. We're not done yet, but we'll go on a short break now. We'll be right back in a moment to look at what is playing out in the U.S. Stay with us. My name is Yinka Babalola. My name is Ijama Pelokoro. My name is Joshua Hassan. I am 
Rotarian or Moth Sunday Lawson. It's Ife Yomarita Ages here. My friends call me Ife. My name is Rotarian Lola Dari. I'm inviting you to keep watching Sook News. It's the right station to tune to. I like Sook News. Sook News is good. I want to charge you all to listen to Sook News. Watch the news. You can have unlimited news first time. Find Sook News. Be with Sook News. Never switch off. You are better for it. Sick news is the real thing. Listen to their coverage and you'll be glad you did. Turn to your YouTube, turn to your Instagram, turn to all your digital, digital channels and look for Sook News. Keep watching. Keep watching. Please guys, keep watching. Sook News. In the heart of South Saharan Africa, where commerce meets progress, welcome to Sook News, your source for business, economy and development insights that drive nations forward. From the vibrant streets of Lagos, Africa's fastest economic hub, Souk News takes you on a journey of discovery, analyzing and reporting the facts that lay the foundation for growth and development. We don't just report the news, we create it. Souk News is more than a channel, it is a catalyst for change, spotlighting the stories that shape economies, inspire entrepreneurs, and fear progress. Covering business, finance, technology, energy, and many more, Soup News provides a daily deep dive into the stories that matter, interviews with industry titans, and analysis that empowers your understanding of economic landscape. Join us daily as we dissect, discuss, and deliver the most relevant and factual news on business and the economy. Soup News is your trusted guide, empowering you with the knowledge to make informed decisions. Latif Jakonde Born Latif Kayode Jakonde in the Ekbetedu area of Lagos Island, Lagos State on July 1929. He studied at the Lagos Public School at Enowa, Lagos Island, then at Bonham Memorial Methodist School, Port Harcourt, King's College, enrolled at Elisha Grammar School, where he edited a literary paper called The Quarterly Mirror. Jack Onde began a career in journalism in 1949 with the Daily Service and joined the Nigerian Tribune in 1953. The owner, Chief Obafemi Awolowo, appointed Jack Onde editor-in-chief of the Tribune in 1956. Jack Onde established John West Publications in 1975 after leaving Tribune and began to publish the Lagos News. He served as the first president of the newspaper Proprietors Association of Nigeria NPAN. Jack Onde ran for election as executive governor of Lagos State in 1979 on the Unity Party of Nigeria platform. His administration was effective and open and implemented the cardinal policies of his party. He introduced housing and educational programs targeting the poor, building new neighborhood primary and secondary schools, and providing free primary and secondary education. He gave poor people's children education, and many of them are now very prominent in the society today. Jack Onde established the Lagos State University and constructed over 30,000 housing units. After the military takeover in 1983, Jack Onde was charged, prosecuted, and convicted of treason and later pardoned. He served as Minister of Works under the Sani Abacha military regime. He died in Lagos on February 11, 2021. Latif Jack Onde was the first civilian governor of Lagos State. Latif Kayode Jakonde, Souk Enlightenment. The challenge of governance is to see how we can leverage what is on the ground and convert this to world for the people. Russia, China are gaining entry into Africa and it would appear that some Western countries are losing out. You're working as an expatriate worker, then you're paid in your currency. But then if you must spend those money, you need to convert those money to the local currency to spend. For social security to work, we need to know exactly how many we are. 
We don't have a precise number. We need to know exact location of people. When we address this exchange rate volatility, we will see definitely cost of goods and services will come down. From a security point of view, we should employ the technology to ensure that we can track individuals and goods uh, within the continent. These, this early exchange with Femi Ayodele. You know, the early exchange is all about shipping policy and advanced development with our conversation today. We're set to give the best of programming. And blessing Aiche. We do hope that you enjoy every time you spend with us here today. The world needs peace. The world needs to come to a round table and find solutions to the pockets of troubles. Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development. Glad to know you're still there with us. It's the early exchange and uh, we started our global update from Nigeria. We headed to India and now it's time for us to go to the U.S. Looking at the controversial spending bill. President Joe Biden on Saturday made history by signing this bill, this $1.2 trillion uh, spending bill into law. These controversies have been on for a while. It went through the U.S. House of Representatives. It went through Senate. And now it got to the table of the president who signed it on Saturday. Let's see what will be the impact of this bill. We are still how Sam Uruwiji are joining us to shed more light on this development. Glad you have you join us once again. Thank you, Femi. Thank Welcome you, Blessing. Back. Thank you, Blessing. You know, we had this discussion a few weeks ago talking about uh, the U.S. spending bills, the $1.2 trillion bill. And I asked you to predict what will happen. I turned you to a prophet, and you predicted that it will pass through the U.S. Senate. And now, not just doing that, the president has signed the bill. He's signing from his hometown on Saturday. What do you make of this? Yeah, thank you very much indeed. It uh, makes you a good prophet now. You said it. Uh, I, I don't want to sound like a prophet. Okay. Uh, uh, we just uh, spoke to some of the issues based on the facts that were valuable at that particular point in time. Uh, thank you for the sentiment anyway. Uh, what is important is um, this uh, <laughs> particular bill has been so contentious that uh, it finally got through uh, six months into the uh, uh, financial year, uh, which shows to a large extent that even America, which is the beacon of democracy, is isolated from uh, um, some power play uh, that do occur uh, within the parliamentary uh, proceeding. But key is that uh, earlier, uh, about two weeks ago, when we spoke to this issue, where about uh, 459 uh, US uh, uh, billion uh, was, uh, was signed uh, to cater for some of those critical um, departments. Uh, this one that uh, came to the 1.2 uh, trillion uh, will take care of uh, defense. Uh, defense account for 70% of uh, that bill, homeland security, health, and uh, other social services. So I think in spite of the uh, uh, political bickering, uh, a bipartisan uh, nature uh, came through very late. Even uh, it was one hour above the threshold uh, that they set for themselves. On Saturday, I think, I think about 2 a.m., uh, that thing was uh, signed uh, uh, finally. So every department and agency of government uh, has been taken care of uh, adequately with this uh, final uh, signing. But in spite of that, the damage in terms of uh, uh, relationship between the Republican and the Democrat we see exists for a long while. But uh, what is important is that uh, the bill has uh, finally come to it full cycle. All right. So when we talked about this uh, some time ago, not too long, about two weeks ago, when they had just approved uh, a spending package to take care of some ministries, now the full package has been approved and it's going to run through to November, um, September, rather, $1.2 trillion. Did they have to wait to even pass deadline overnight to have this agreement? 74 24 votes at the end of the day isn't this fire brigade approach i asked this the last time but it's been a repeat no i don't think so uh there were debates uh 
for certain uh, part of the budget uh, uh, to cause suspending. But then, uh, you know the nature, and this is an election year between the Democrats and the Republican. Uh, these issues were um, far above uh, the parliamentary disagreement. But by and large, when you look at uh, the minimum uh, threshold standard uh, for the parliament to have taken cognizance of that, at least they, they eventually allowed that one to pass through. I think it's just a challenge in terms of uh, parliamentary proceeding. Uh, I won't see it as a fire brigade approach, but then uh, uh, parochial interest in terms of uh, party lineage uh, was uh, taken uh, out of context, but eventually they need to do the needful uh, in the interest of uh, the American uh, people. You know, if you look at the controversy trailing this bill and the way it went through the U.S. House of Reps got to Senate. Uh, in fact, when Senate had to vote, uh, it was 74 against 24. Now, but the issue is some argue, looking at the way this thing was delayed, the back and forth, some argue that, well, it's the beauty of democracy. But there are also concerns that lateness in implementing those bills will also affect economic issues and the departments involved. What's your take on this? Uh, before the final uh, approval, I think there are mechanisms uh, within uh, uh, the system that take cognizance of uh, spending even when uh, the bill has not come uh, into uh, its full cycle. And we used to have that here in Nigeria as well, which, uh, you know, we model uh, democracy on that of uh, the U.S. So, but the key, uh, to a very large extent, uh, some of those spending, there were some approval to spend uh, before the final bill. So, in my view, uh, the impact will not be too much on the economy because there were a certain percentage of approval that they needed to spend. But the challenge was that if that didn't come through by 2 a.m. on Saturday, uh, 23rd, there have been some issues in terms of uh, shutdown. Uh, shutdown in the system. So, uh, essentially, what it did was uh, to forestall. Um, a full shutdown of uh, governmental processes and system. So what is important is finally uh, a bipartisan nature of the American uh, democracy uh, hold the day eventually. So this passage allows Congress to focus on something else, maybe start planning the package for next year. Hopefully they will not have this kind of uh, uh, disagreement for long that will lead to uh, overnight passage of spending bills. What's your thoughts? Uh, regrettably, the six months uh, uh, they used in terms of uh, trying to debate the bills uh, was unusually too long, and uh, that brings to question as well uh, the sophistication of the American uh, uh, parliamentary system. Nevertheless, what is key is that um, the bill has come to its uh, final fruition, but then they cannot face uh, the uh, uh, legislative uh, processes and see how they can foster this uh, from October 1 when a new uh, uh, financial uh, year will start in the U.S. Don't you think this might distort the budget cycle, you know, for the U.S.? And what do you make of this? And also now that um, this bill has been passed, what do you expect that the... Um, how will you expect that the U.S. will learn from this drama that happened, the lessons for U.S., and then your response to the budget cycle for the U.S.? I think the challenge, like I mentioned uh, a while ago, is there. But uh, I think what is uppermost, and uh, like you mentioned uh, earlier, the beauty of democracy is the ability to reach uh, compromises. And uh, once compromises are met, uh, the bipartisan nature uh, had helped to uh, foster that uh, problem. But there are lessons. Uh, one of the key points or key highlight is that um, they will take cognizance of um, some of the cuts that they want to make in the new financial year, which begins in October 1st. And I'm sure this is a disagreement uh, that almost all uh, government processes uh, will be taking cognizance of uh, timely. And I'm sure that. Um, this may not repeat itself in terms of uh, uh, the timing. This is uh, almost half a year into uh, a financial year. I think that's uh, to a very large disturbing. 
if it was in our climb, I'm sure the impact will have been more negative. But by and large, uh, we salute uh, uh, democracy be at its best uh, on Saturday after the full signing. All right, so these are the uh, ministries that have been catered for with the bill, um, spending bill signed. Um, Department of State, Homeland Security, Defense, Labor and Health, and uh, Human Services, as well as funds for foreign operations, financial services, and the legislative branch. How critical are these uh, last sets that were funded? So let's assume that they had delayed a day further or even delayed more. What could have been the implication of this? Not having funds for homeland uh, security, defense, labor and health, uh, state services, state department rather, foreign operations and financial services. The blessing I mentioned earlier, uh, in spite of that challenge, uh, mm. there are windows in terms of oppression. I'm sure that uh, those departments and agencies of government uh, has been working, but then they don't have uh, uh, a regulatory backing uh, for some of those expenditures. So it was not entirely that uh, spendings were not uh, made or those departments were not uh, uh, operational. But then the legal backing uh, in terms of appropriation uh, was not there, but then now that it has been signed to law, so they have the legal backing uh, to spend those money. But the challenge, particularly in defense, you know, American uh, have so much uh, investment in their uh, defense area. So the issues of uh, Ukraine uh, and some other uh, proxy war that America are involved in uh, with this signing, I'm sure that uh, the support uh, that will go to those um, uh, sector and those relationships uh, will come uh, into fusion speedily after being signed to law. All right, let's wrap up with the reaction of President Biden to the ISO saga. Uh, and I would like to quote him. Uh, he says, these agreements represent a compromise, which means neither side got everything it wanted. Your take on that as we wrap up. Simply, uh, politics uh, uh, is compromise. And uh, uh, you might differ in terms of uh, certain values, certain views. But your ability to make uh, compromises uh, is the beauty of democracy. And uh, uh, as a leader, uh, you must learn to make compromise. And in the world of uh, uh, the US president, uh, Joe Biden, what it is is that um, even those that had very serious di disagreement, uh, in the final analysis, uh, there were some compromises. And the citizens are happier for it. And I think, like you mentioned, our blessing asked earlier, uh, the lessons uh, learned uh, from this last uh, issue uh, will be far reaching in terms of uh, parliamentary proceeding in the US in the days to come. I guess at the end of the day, it's all about national interests for the US, as it should be for every country. Thank you very much, Sam Oroji, Director, Center for Public Policy, for being with us most part of the show today. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. With Brother Cottons here, thank you for watching. I am Blessing H. Tomorrow will be another time when LX Change begins at 8 a.m. West African time. Do enjoy your day. Stay with Soup News. The rest of it. And now that the Naira outlook is getting better as Nigerians, we have the obligation of also playing our role, which is to ensure that we patronize locally made goods. This will help to strengthen the Naira. That's my advocacy to you. Don't forget. LXD returns tomorrow. I remain Femi Ayodele. Bye for now.